PNC is proud to support Business Forward, where local leaders discuss the challenges and opportunities and how we do business in Central Illinois. Welcome to Business Forward. I'm your host, Matt George. Joining me tonight, Pastor Chuck Brown. Chuck is the founder and senior pastor at Victory Christian Church. Welcome. Hey, Matt. <laughs> I, appreciate, I appreciate you coming on. I mean, there's a lot to talk about. And, you know, before the show started, we just talked about, you know, our community. And, and we have, I, I was just saying to you, I think it's everybody's duty to take care of the community they, that they live in. And, you know, there is no race when it comes to taking care of community. It's about people. And I think, you know, there's just so many issues right now within every community across the United States. And one of them we're gonna talk about that you're gonna help solve. And I love to talk about that. But first of all, how did you, have you grown up in Peoria? Did you, are you from here? Well, first of all, thank you for having me yeah. as well. Uh, yeah, a combination of Peoria. I was actually born in Chicago. Okay. My first home uh, was Caprini Green Projects. <laughs> so you were born? Yes, in okay. Chicago, youngest of 10. And uh, my parents, you know, obviously migrated in this uh, area. And so I, we came to Peoria left once, uh, lived in Kankakee for a little while, a little country town. Yeah. So I tell people all the time, I, I was born in the projects of Chicago and, and then the uh, little country town of Kankakee before coming to Peoria, so I'm both ghetto and country. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how long have you lived here? Most of my life. Though. Okay. We came here, I'm a graduate of Manual High School, actually attended McKinley uh, before we left and went to Kankakee and then came back to, and I graduated from Manual. Uh, high school. I can't tell you the year because then you'll know, realize I'm almost 100. <laughs> so <laughs> prior to Southside, Manual High School. That is great. That is great. So um, I know you've done so many great things and, and you, you do have community in mind, you have people in mind. But, you know, one of the things I do remember you from is, is these job fairs that you that you had done in the past, and and talk about that. I mean, what what made you get into that piece of just from the need from the church, or how did you come about that? Well, you know, I guess first and foremost, uh, to me as a community church, you know, when we started uh, Victory uh, over ten years ago, one of the first things I wanted to do was connect uh, our efforts in the community to help people. We didn't want to just be a church inside the walls, but we wanted to help people meet the essential services. And, and there are several uh, churches that do food pantries. Um, and you have the uh, Dream Center with, with Pastor King found an incredible uh, leader. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so churches are, they find that niche, that area where God wants them to be planted. And they uh, help the community within that, that area. In our case, you know, God put it in my heart to help connect people with employment opportunities. So without any real knowledge, I just reached, started reaching out to employers mm -hmm. and organized uh, our first job fair. Uh, at that time, we were at 603 West Nebraska, and we had the event down in the fellowship hall, and over 200 people showed up. Wow. And I said, hey, I'm pretty good at this. So, yeah. so we uh, tried it, and uh, it eventually grew, uh, exploded. Uh, we, we've had events as large as the Civic Center, uh, our largest job fair, I believe, was in 2015. We had well over 2,000 applicants uh, coming in the door. So we have continued to build that relationship with over 100 companies uh, in the area. It's, it's a great asset for the human resource people, yeah. but moreover, it's an amazing opportunity for people looking for, for jobs. Are you seeing from a, a business standpoint, because, you know, I, I interview a lot of small business owners and you hear it all over the country that it's just hard to hire people right now. And, and I, I, I think some people think, how is that? If there's so many different job openings, why is it so hard to hire? Well, I guess a lot of the companies uh, in, in their defense, technology, uh, there are different skill sets that are required uh, to perform most uh, job uh, career opportunities. Mm -hmm. And 
and some of the people that are seeking employment are lacking some of those essential skills that help make the company uh, work. Okay. But uh, there are great partners uh, that also attend our job fairs like uh, Illinois Central College. Uh, even in the past, we worked with Mid-State College uh, mm -hmm. several years ago, and then you've got uh, 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 MTI. So we try to partner with uh, our urban leagues and different organizations to be a part of it. So they're really job and resource fairs. And what that does is it just helps to bring that those relationships together, not only with just the job seekers and the employers, but also with resource providers to help uh, that skill set, the training necessary. Yeah. So, but it's still going to be a, it's a challenge nationwide as far as unemployment. You know, we we have our share here in Peoria, but I think we've been doing a pretty good job of making relationships. Well over a thousand people uh, every year go through our events. Yeah, so. I had Denise Moore on with the. Um, the resource center that she has, uh, yes. Minority Development Resource Center. And, you know, you're talking about, you brought up technology, and that was one of the discussion points yes. we had, is if, if people, people want to learn, but how do you get people into, you know, opportunities, I guess, so to speak. So, I, you know, I think there's, you got the junior achievement, you have what she's doing, you have what you're doing. And, and if there's some sort of collaboration, we actually could grow business. And I think if you think about you for an example, like I know you're not a guy to take credit for it, but think about the lives you've changed just by mm. someone being employed. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It, it, it uh, you know, it was one of the things that uh, my, my late wife, she used to come and help me <laughs> do yeah. the events. It was one of the things we look forward to was that, that smile on their face when they come in, it's like you, you never think about that, what you just said. Right. But the fact is, is you're opening uh, the door for someone to have an incredible opportunity with an Ameren or a Caterpillar or an OSF. And there were times uh, young people would come and they weren't ready, you know, or they right. didn't have a shirt and tie on. So we kept a box of ties around the corner. We'd be like, come here, we run in the bathroom and straighten up your hair, yep. okay? Put this tie on, it looks a little more presentable. One young lady, we sent her home. She did not get offended. We said, we need you to go change, you know, and come back here. And don't. And she said, I know, where's your address? We're coming to get you if you don't come back. Sure enough, she came back and she was able to land an amazing career with uh, Caterpillar. So it's wow. really about uh, exposure. These events expose people to opportunities and for these great companies, uh, it exposes the opportunity. And right. so it's just making those connections. I mean, think about the, the psychological safety piece of being employed. Yes, amen. <laughs> I mean, that's as about as important as it gets. And then Denise Moore, her, her main focus is uh, with a small business development. She's doing just, she has done an absolute incredible right. job. Even been, she's been very instrumental in helping me even with the project that I'm working Good. on now. Good, so. I, I, that's what I was, I didn't know if there was a connection or a figure. Yes. Yeah, and, and I think that there's a lot of people that want to see good. I, I believe that. I think uh, I was able to do a uh, training program uh, for Andrew Rand. He's the CEO mm -hmm. of uh, AMT. Of AMA, AMT, and so I trained 163 of his team, and it was really a focus on diversity, and this program was called Time Out. And what we'll realize is if we may seem divided. I, I'm not sure when we all been on one accord. <laughs> it's not. Right. It's not even America, but at the end of the day, most people have the same desires and needs and goals. And so what we did in that training program, we came to the conclusion that we have more in common than we have different. Yeah, so. I, I wasn't gonna go down this route, but I think I'll bring it up. I always say that people don't really understand the true meaning of collaboration. Right. I think people use the term a lot, but I don't think they do it. No, it's easier to, uh, be in your comfort zone. Yeah. Most people would prefer to be around like minds or uh, people that grew up the same or same culture or same environment, but that's limiting yourself and it also limits your opportunities. Yeah. All right. This is the topic I can't wait to talk about. <laughs> it's on your shirt. Let's go right into it. Harvest, market, and grill. Tell me about it. Well, uh, one of the things, uh, uh, I, I got to tell it all. I, I okay? want you to. Uh, when I decided to run for mayor, <laughs> yeah, it it was this seven step vision that God gave me uh, that involves employment, community development, 
uh, business development, and there were these uh, bullet points that was a part of this itinerary. Well, you know, obviously we, we've elected an amazing mayor, and, uh, but the vision is still there. And Harvest is part of a larger vision. And there's an area, there's a couple of areas of our community that I feel is struggling. Uh, one, particularly the South Side where I grew up, has been uh, struggling economically. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a, uh, it, there's lots of challenges. And then there's a, a counterculture that is creating a very toxic environment in, in a neighborhood with some incredible, incredible people. Yes. And so the agenda for Harvest obviously is to bring the essential service and product that people truly deserve and a supermarket is what's missing. And so to me, with entrepreneur experience and as a business owner, you have to uh, find a need and meet it. But this supermarket gives us this opportunity to create a staple in, in the community and put us in the direction of changing the narrative of the community. I like the word deserves. It's true. Yes. So where's the building located? We are in, we're 210 South Western Avenue. Uh, we're in the old Aldi's. Aldi's were there, they built that store, man, they built it solid. And they were there for several years. Uh, their business model, uh, they made some commitments in their business model, which is why they left uh, the area. Uh, the Save-A-Lot came in a couple of years later through uh, Denise Moore's leadership yeah. in attracting that supermarket, but they didn't last a year. And so uh, that left the community, in addition to Kroger's, uh, Madison Park leaving, uh, as, as well as CVS, you know, a lot of those uh, uh, major chains leaving the area. And there is a reason why they left the area. What's the reason? Well, Food Desert... Uh, communities, there's a combination of challenges. And the, the biggest challenge that most people would probably have to accept, the reality is stores deal with what's called shrink. Okay. Uh, shrink uh, leads to heightened security. Shrink uh, involves uh, uh, your, your, uh, your items uh, going bad, you have to get rid of as a supermarket owner. You can only keep something on the shelf so long. Right. But then items coming up missing or you have uh, crime in a specific area and it's just it's just a reality. Uh, supermarkets are only uh, earning one cent, one to three cents on the dollar. So uh, food desert stores are usually losing four cents on the dollar and they're, they're able to stay in a community only for so long and they depend on uh, public and private uh, funding to help mitigate that gap yeah. to keep them out of the uh, red. And so those stores are not coming back. Yeah, which is sad. Yeah, it's not good. Um, it, it's bad for the community because yeah. uh, food deserts, there is a higher uh, uh, rate of obesity, uh, diabetes, the, uh, the uh, death rate is 50% higher in food yeah. desert communities. Uh, because there's no fresh and affordable produce yes. and, and healthy food choices. And so it just kind of leaves the neighborhood uh, dry for the most part. I think people hear the term food desert. I don't think they really know exactly, uh, not all people, but some people don't know what it means. And so, and what you just said just is, is the byproduct of not having access because it, Take somebody, I'm just going to give an example. Take somebody who's 80 years old and has no transportation. And there's a grocery store that's two blocks away. They can figure it out. They can have people help them. They can do this. If you don't have a grocery store within three miles, what are you going to do? And then there's gas stations. And gas stations sell a lot of chips. Right. And they sell a lot of Mountain Dew and things like that. And so they do, a lot of people do not have access, like you said, to greens, fruits, it, all of that. And it does lead to medical issues. And I, it goes back to my point of bigger picture of, of what a community is. You can't have a piece of the community struggle while 
it's okay over here. It's, it's, I like the word deserves. I think you said it perfectly. Well, um, Harvest, uh, our goal is to provide a fresh, affordable, and uh, nutritional uh, food to the community. Uh, one of the challenges with food deserts, uh, particularly in my area, is dollar stores proliferate food desert communities. And again, this is no insult to their business model, but unfortunately, the majority of what they are going to carry is processed food with longer shelf life. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to be uh, good to, for the, the benefit of the community. But the, the other challenge is with, within that food desert, uh, food desert, let me just kind of you know, give a little bit of a description of what they consider a food desert. Okay. That's when the majority of the neighborhood is at least a mile away from I did not uh, know that. a supermarket in urban communities, but in rural areas, at least 10 miles. And so there are over 2 million uh, people affected by food who live in food desert just in the state of Illinois. And I believe there's approximately 53.6 million living in food deserts across the country. And Say so, the stat again for Illinois. What was it? it it's, it's well over 2 million people that actually oh live in food deserts goodness. in the state of Illinois. And so it, it is a challenge. Uh, the other issue is when, they, when you look at it statistically, uh, food deserts, 80% of the residents are people of color. Okay. And so uh, in addition to heart disease and, and diabetes and different things, cancers and things that we are challenged with, yeah. it increases the problem. And so by bringing harvest to uh, the South Side, which, which is just an exciting project, exciting store. I'm excited for it. You know, we want to become that staple in the community, more than just that supermarket, but we want to give away apples and hope. We want to provide a place where people can be seen and heard, feel safe, where they can gather. Uh, you know, we've got the food court inside, which we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we've got a place where people can congregate and get to know your neighbor. Yeah, be a part almost of like a, a community center that is a restaurant slash cafe slash grocery store. Yes, well, the cafe is going to put Let's a few pounds on it. me. I know. I, well, I'm I'm reading it. it. I mean, it it has you have a, a area for drinks and coffee, but I mean, you're serving all kinds of great food. It's 30 seats uh, that we're going to have uh, in the uh, cafe. We're very excited about it. The grill, pardon me, mm -hmm. which it will have brown coffee and cream uh, where you can get, you know, obviously coffee products uh, in brown coffee and cream. We will have a, a waffle you can get in the mornings. It'll, you can get it with eggs or bacon. Part it, that's uh, eggs, bacon, love sausage. It. Love it. Uh, and, and they're delicious, but it's the one you can get with smoked turkey as well. So, but then they also will have the chicken and turkey hut, which will feature our, our world-class smoked turkey legs. I, uh, that's <laughs> what I was going to ask you about. Because I, when I saw the picture, I was like, okay, I could eat that probably at any time during the day. <laughs> well, I wish I could say I'm original, but uh, we were in Texas a few years ago, and we, we were fortunate to go to the turkey leg hut down there. And it's like two hours to get in, get in the is, restaurant, two I hour line. I love it. Just great environment, and so I never forgot that, and I came home and, and uh, worked on that recipe. So these turkey legs, are they taste like ham. They fall off the bone. You eat them with a fork. I can you I get can. them stuffed mm. with shrimp alfredo, raisin Cajun mac and cheese, or, or, uh, or, or buy you dirty rice. So it's going to be yeah. great. So I heard an interview, and it was, uh, so you said you don't need, we're not going to offer 15 types of ketchup. We're going to offer two. Right. And so explain the concept of the grocery area. Well, in the supermarket, uh, you, you, there's a grocery store and there's a supermarket. You have to do over $2 million to be qualified as a supermarket. So our projections, we, we're, we're figuring at least four, four, four to five million for our first year. And the uh, food selection, the choice between a Kroger's and an Aldi's, Kroger's, you can get maybe 35,000 different products. Aldi's, they're only going to carry 1,400 essential products. Okay, I did not know that. And they can, in addition to their own supplies, you know, their own brands, they can buy in bulk. And that's how stores like Aldi's and Save-A-Lot are able to pass those savings to the customer. 
it also, uh, in, in our case, we're going to model after Aldi's. We're just going to carry the essentials. So okay. you won't have 15 to 20 different ketchups, which also leads to buyer fatigue. With Aldi's, you can get in, you can get out. I'll say with, yeah. with Harvest, we'll have that same supply. But in addition, we're going to canvas the neighborhood and find out what's important to the people. Yeah, so that's one of your initiatives, actually, is to the, the larger vision is to talk to people and help revitalize the Absolutely. community. Absolutely. And you're going to be providing jobs, too. That's what people forget. We're, we're here to serve people. Yeah. Harvest is uh, our, our mission, uh, once again, is to uh, provide apples and hope. We're here to serve that community. So in addition to our supermarket, finding out what's important to uh, people in the community, what other products we have in addition to African-American population, we have a, a growing Latino population. Yes. We have a very diverse uh, white, black, Latino community. And yeah. by providing that essential service, to them, uh, we will help to nourish them and, and, and provide what, what's important without them having to go all the way over the bridge or way out on the lake. But again, because Harvest is part of a larger vision, you know, was something you were touching on, what we look to reinvest back in the community. I want to read something. Our store's mission is to reduce barriers for community residents of South Peoria to access fresh fruits and vegetables but our heart reaches so much further than just a grocery store. We provide a wonderful place where people can be seen, heard, and feel safe. That's beautifully written. That's absolutely, that's, that's, that's def, that is our uh, main objective, is to become that staple in the community. There will be several things going on at Harvest. Uh, you what? might have a uh, you know, farmer's market running through the summer, uh, you might see a uh, family roller skating night one night when the store closes. You may see uh, we're going to partner with the police department again. There's going to be a big community-wide festival in our parking lot uh, in August. And so... Uh, Make sure I get the invite. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I can't wait. <laughs> you got to come. Last year we did it, you know, even though we're not open yet, you know, we still, you know, immediately our goal again is to serve people. We want to make that immediate uh, connection. And so the chief of police and uh, Peoria Police Department, and uh, we partnered with them and we had vendors, we had bounce houses, they gave away supplies for kids and uh, free hot dogs. It was just amazing. That's and awesome. So we're looking to double it up this year. Well, when, do you, when do you open? Well, we're going to open in two phases because this is very difficult. This is very hard uh, financing a project of, 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 of this magnitude. Um, it, it's, you're looking at a building that had nothing in it. And so we're looking at half a million dollars in just refrigeration alone just to mm. get that in. And so we're going to open in two phases, the food court being first. And once we get that food court open, the supermarket within three uh, to six months following. And okay. that is our goal. Uh, and we have to do that uh, based on my, my ability to finance and, and get things done. But, um, we're, we're, we're hoping our projection as far as getting the food court itself open, we're in there getting that built out now as we speak. And so our goal is to have it open before the end of the summer. Good. So Good. hopefully we don't run into any supply chain issues as far as equipment. But I don't foresee that. So we should be good. You know, what's interesting is you probably six months ago or 12 months ago, that was probably the hiccup. Yes. <laughs> but now you're probably in a different spot. So. How do you get the word out besides being on this show? I mean, we need to get the word out. People need to know what, what's the positive things that are happening in town. It, it, it comes down to, again, when you touch the life of one person, they're going to tell other people about it. And I can't go anywhere. Uh, Walmart, Kroger's. Uh, the gas station, when is the store going to open? Yeah. No matter where I am. And that, that to me is very exciting. It doesn't make me feel bad. It just makes me feel excited that people are talking. And, and I mean, every race, every culture is just exciting. They're excited about it and they're looking forward to it. And so uh, we're, we're, we're going to, you know, social media has definitely helped. This helps. And yeah. so we're going to be pretty good here. Yeah, I see. You've got a strong social media presence. and. Yeah. Hopefully this does help because I think we need to, 
uh, support this great idea. Uh, just quickly, how did the idea come about? Did, did you have you always wanted to do something like this? Absolutely not. <laughs> I, I wondered. Yeah, and I like shopping in grocery stores, but uh, you know, and, and as far as uh, we have access to information today now, faster than the speed of light. What's helping me uh, with the supermarket project? Our food supplier. I have consultants. I have yeah. attorneys. That you know, we, you have to surround yourself with people that you know and sound, understand. Right. You have to put a good team around you. Yes. Well, I just want to thank you for coming on, Pastor Chuck Brown. This is so great. I uh, um, I love that you came on and you're doing great work. Keep it up. And if you need anything from us, we'll help. I'm Matt George, and this is another episode of Business Forward. Thanks for tuning in to Business Forward, brought to you by PNC. PNC Bank, National Association, member FDIC.